but I talk to a customer literally every single day. And that's a job where you have too many jobs, but it, that's not a habit I was gonna let fall by the wayside. Because how do I know what my market needs if I'm not talking to customers? So, I mean, obviously I teach product teams how to do this, but I think everybody in the organization needs to be talking to customers all the time. I really wanted my teams to be the ones closest to the customers. Like I definitely would join and I would shadow, I would watch recordings, watch user testing interviews, anything. But I didn't want to end up with a different line of pursuit than they were. And so that's why I really focused on enablement of the teams. And if they were blocked and I would have them share out what they were learning, I would make that very transparent to the organization in multiple formats. Get ready for the Product Tea with Leah, your fun-sized dose of business, tech, growth, and product chatter. I'm your host, Leah, and it's time to spill the tea. For the tireless leadership morning today i'm hosting not one but two special guests the first one is so fearless her products don't dare to have bugs they have features with attitudes from making waves at beach body to building careers a career builder she now guides the product leaders of tomorrow while scaring the pants off of underperformance with a name like a superhero and a resume to match let's welcome the champion of courage hope gorian Hope, how are you doing today? I'm great, Leah. That's a very, a lot of big shoes to fill in that introduction, but thank you. (laughs) My second guest has an uncanny ability to make research activity sound like a gripping detective novel. She turned, I think, into I know for countless teams. And from Spotify's beat to Tesco streets, she teaches businesses what a value means. The Da Vinci of discovery, the outcomes oracle, the sensei of systems, the author of continuous discovery habits. Teresa Torres, how are you doing today? Wow, that was quite the intro. Thank you, Leah. uh, My name is Hope Gurion. As Leah generously said, I do coach product leaders and teams, former chief product officer, and I had a little podcast for a while, but Leah, I'm glad you're continuing the education tradition in podcasting because there's so much to know. But yes, I have a little company called Fearless Product, and I love working with first-time product leaders, product leaders that are leading transformations in their companies and teams that are seeking to be more outcome-driven. That's very nice. And I will introduce you back to the audience real quick and then you, Teresa, can introduce yourself. So for me, it's really interesting because you have some relevance to me. I think the first article that I read from you was called Why Can't I Be a Good Girl and a Good Product Leader at the Same Time? That was a quite interesting moment for me because I was one of those endless pleasers, you know, like through all my life and uh, still working on it when it comes to family. But at least in my professional life, I have improved a lot. And I remember this because in this article, I think you also had a couple of memes and animated GIFs and so forth. So that was that. And then I also discovered your Fearless Product Leadership podcast, which is a really cool concept, I have to say. I think if I remember it correctly, it was like four to five perspectives on one specific question that you always mentioned in the episode itself, which I think binged through in like two days at some point because I was a bit bored and I was so fascinated. That's a really, really cool concept. And I think your tagline was something like confidence through evidence. And it resonated a lot with me. So maybe we'll talk about this in a bit, a little bit more as well on the leadership side. But yeah, Teresa, can you go next? Yeah, so I'm Teresa Torres. I work as a product discovery coach. I basically work at the team level, so teaching cross-functional teams how to make better decisions about what to build. I started out coaching teams. Now we're more of an online course business. Hope is actually one of our instructors. Uh, We have a couple other instructors as well. And it's really just all about empowering teams through better decision making by building in fast feedback cycles with customers through both customer interviewing and assumption testing. That's really cool because you have also some relevance to me in my life. So I have your book here, Continuous Discovery Habits. And on the inside, there's a very beautifully handwritten, how do you say that in English? Is it dedication? I think that's what it is. So one of my engineers, Javier, who is an engineer, right? He's not a product manager at all. Like he gifted me that book two years ago. Mm. And I, at first I was like, hey, you know, like, thank you and so forth, right? And I started to read it and I looked into it and I'm, I absolutely love it because in Europe as well, it's just not that common to do good product management. Let's just call it by its name. I mean, yeah, you cannot, right? But like I'm European, so <laughs> I'm going to hear it from everyone. 
And one of the interesting things there is, is that also at the back of the book, I think you speak about that you've helped over 7,000 product people develop their discovery skills. Did you ever do the math on how many it is now? Yeah, we actually have had over 13,000 students in the Product Talk Academy. And that doesn't count all of our coaching teams. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't honestly know how to count at this point. But it's quite a number of people, which is pretty remarkable. And I will say I nodded when, with your comment with Europe, but it wasn't because I was agreeing with you. It's because I've heard so many Europeans express the same exact thing, but I disagree with it 100%. I think Hope probably oh, very um, good. sees the same thing as me, where a lot of European teams are way more eager to learn and are investing in these skills at, I think, a higher rate than what we see in the U.S. Well, there is more potential to, let's just put it in this way, right? Like, so like, I, now I have to just, I have to just uh, push back a little bit, but yeah, hey, 14,000 people, that means like 40% uh, year on year growth since the last two years. So it's a very healthy business. <laughs> so yeah, no, but like, it's, it's really great. So like, what brings you two together? Like, so you said that you have, you're teaching together, like the area is a little bit broad. Who is your ideal person that comes to either you two into these into this learning material that you're now putting out? Like, who is the ideal person to do this? Yeah, I think there's two levels to this. And Hope, feel free to add to this. I think what we're seeing is that there's a big conversation going on in the industry about moving from an output mindset to an outcome mindset. And what happens when an organization decides to make that shift is both the leadership has to evolve to, to make that shift and the individual teams have to evolve to make that shift. And so that's really where we focus. We're looking at organizations where the leadership has decided as an organization, we want to evolve from an output mindset to an outcome mindset. And I know Hope works at both the leadership level and then also teaches at the team level. I focus on the team level. And it's really about how do we support organizations as they shift from an output mindset to an outcome mindset. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that the, I mean, you said it, I think there are a lot of people that we talk to who are interested in making that transition. But sometimes when I'm either speaking to somebody at the team level or a leader who thinks that just their teams need to be trained, that's a signal to me that maybe their leadership really doesn't yet understand what is required to make this shift, that it is not just we need to train the teams. It is leadership and a team mindset, habit shift let, that needs to occur in order to sort of cross the chasm to outcome oriented ways of working. This is really funny to me because I remember when I was getting hired at small PDF back then, like it was like, that was about three and a half years ago. I remember the CEO, which I could talk about now because he's not there anymore. So he was talking about uh, my PMs. They're just not doing what I want. They're not delivering the ideas that it, they're not big enough, right? And I think it's very interesting that you're saying this because you're combining both exactly what's necessary, right? So like we have the operative layer on how to do something right. So like in this case, discovery. And Teresa, I mean, I think you own the entire topic. Like <laughs> there's absolutely nobody on LinkedIn or some, like I don't, there's just no one, right? Like this is exactly your little box that you have just carved out and nobody's coming in. And then on the other side, we have also like the leadership style where, you know, you can teach the continuous discovery habits all day long if you don't have inputs or like the empowerment from leadership that you can actually also own this kinds of stuff, then there's nothing good coming out of it. So I really like this kind of dynamic. I'll tell you, when I'm talking to people will reach out, they're interested in, you know, master classes. If there's no leader on the call, like that to me is the first indication that they're not ready. And that is what we try to diagnose really quickly, because if the leader is not actively participating in understanding what this training could mean for their teams, if we're not having a conversation about what the sort of environment is like, then we're not pursuing doing a training with that organization because they're not, they're not ready yet. Yeah, I do want to add a caveat here, though, because yeah. I think one thing that I really hammer on is if you're an individual contributor, you don't have to wait for your organization yes. to change to work this way. I think where Hope is distinguishing is we have leaders of companies coming to us saying we want to train all of our teams. In that situation, we want to ex set the expectation with the leader that the leader plays a role in accelerating the change. 
and that it's critical that they're a part of the process. But I think it's equally important for all of our individual contributors that are listening that like a lot of the habits in the book, you can adopt regardless of how your organization works. It may not change your organization, but it will change the way you work and it will improve the quality of your work. Yeah. And it can set the example for the rest of the organization about how to make more customer-centric decisions, more evidence-based decisions. And when people start to see that, they wonder why we're not doing more of that. Yeah. So I think like at the organization level, there is like, a, you have to have alignment between leaders. You have to train teams. There has to be this like organizational view of how you're going to get from point A to point B. But I don't want to discount what individuals can do on their own. Yeah. So hmm. I would go as far and say that any directive organization probably cannot handle what's coming out of discovery. Like if it would be good, because I mean, it's not like you're producing something in discovery, then you hand it off and then someone else implements it. Right. Like that's the other thing. I find it quite interesting because I had a talk, I think three days ago with Ravi Mehta on a very, very interesting topic. So basically what he said is, is that as a PM, you need to kind of be skeptic and also like a visionary at the same time, right? But like you're bouncing always between the two. And I find it interesting, Hope, because you also had, I think it was in the podcast where you said like, uh, what was it? I have to look it up now. Confidence through evidence. So in a way, proper research also kind of you're trying to, first, you're trying to dismantle your own hypotheses, right? Like, so how might this fail? What are the constraints of something that we have? But once you kind of have this, this is also becoming your ammunition. And this is something that I also tell people all the time. Like, if you're doing your stuff really thorough, then you already know most of the answers that are coming against it in the end, because whatever you're going to do, you're still going to be on the side of the customer. And what I mean with that is, is that it is in the end your business case and you need to stand for it. And if you have conviction, then you should also be able to drive it through into the company. And by the way, Teresa, if you cannot do it, then I would also say like, I don't know, just run for the hills because the best discovery process is only working as good as you have autonomy to also kind of bring it to the street for sure. Yeah, there are some people who are not convinced by evidence. They hold fast to their ideas that they believe to be true. And so, yeah, I think that's something you have to recognize within your organization. That is when the best you can do is to help create firsthand understanding for those skeptics within your organization, because they won't believe secondhand information, even if you have the courage of conviction, even if you have strong evidence, they will believe their firsthand experience more than your firsthand experience. You know, there's a value that I've heard come up, I think, in two different places now. One I know is at Amazon. I forget the second company. It was on Lenny uh, Murchisky's podcast. He was interviewing a leader, and they both, both companies have this value of, like, leaders are often right. And I think what they're trying to acknowledge with that is that, like, we're muddying the message a little bit with this idea of empowered teams some, I hope and I did a conversation about this recently. Some people interpret that as like, oh, we should be autonomous. We should get to do whatever we want. And what are our leaders doing, intervening and telling us what to do? And I think what these companies are trying to capture is that actually your leaders have a lot of expertise and a lot of experience and it's their job to be right. Now, it doesn't mean their opinion is right, right? And so I think like we have to be careful that the pendulum doesn't swing too far in that fully autonomous realm. Like as an organization, our leaders and our teams need to be aligned, right? And our leaders have to do that role of setting the strategic context, setting our outcomes, even oftentimes setting the like directional way we're going to reach those outcomes. And then we got to free up space for our teams to be empowered to find the best how to get there. And I think it's really important we keep both sides of this. So I would say, like, if you have a leader that's, like, convinced they're right and they're not going to, and they're ignoring evidence that says otherwise, I wouldn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and be like, okay, you need to leave that organization. I think we got to dig in and look at, like, where are we on the spectrum of empowered and not get distracted by autonomous. And we're all learning this, right? Like, that leader's still learning how to empower the team, so like, I don't want to just be like, oh, you failed. You need to leave this organization. It's really more about, okay, this leader has been right a lot in their career. How do we help them move down the empowered spectrum? 
So I didn't mean to fire people. I said, I meant it the other way around, like that you yeah. leave as an individual contributor if you cannot yeah. live through your ideas in any way. So there's an interesting story that I now kind of verified in retrospective, right? So now that I left a small PDF and also the CPO and the CEO left and so forth, I kind of, you know, like I jumped on a call again and I verified a couple of stories. So this was a really interesting one. So we had a huge bet at small PDF to bring collaboration into the product itself, because we had a long, also like a very, very strong indication from the customer base on how we should do this. You know, like people want to collaborate around their documents and so forth. And Leo was pushing for this hard and I could not get it through. And I always thought that the problem is actually with my evidence, you know, I, mean, I got everything together. Like, look, this is the business case. We're going to make so many millions. Like the amount of millions that I pulled out of thin air with my colleagues there were absolutely amazing. And it turns out that in retrospective, when I actually talked to my CPO again, he said that, Leah, it was not the evidence. The board told us not to do it. They said, no, you're just not doing it. And there was no good reason behind it. And I could not tell you also as well at the same time, like, no, we're just not doing it because the board says no, because that is in, you know, in the end, this is a very, very deflating thing. And I don't know, of course, whether I would have been right. I still think I do <laughs> yeah, because I did, this, did the research very thorough. But sometimes you also don't know like what's been happening behind Let's just call it the curtains, right? It's like also like as a leader myself, I know that some things you just cannot talk about it. I think this is a great example because it could have been a very successful product. It doesn't mean it was the right product for that company to build, right? Like there is this bigger picture where like there's an infinite number of good opportunities and it is a board and a leadership team's job to say, we're going to not do these good ideas Right. And I think so that's where I think that we sometimes confuse empowered and autonomous. I think I just have one question, maybe to you, Hope. So this is more in regards to the entire mess that we have in regards to the terminology. You know, like when we talk about autonomous, empowered, leaderships, managers and so forth. So product managers are not managers. Right. And product leaders are not man like they Product leaders are not leaders necessarily. But like, I mean, they are in some way, right? Like they manage product managers. Mm -hmm. Do you also see it in the way that or do you also distinguish in that sense? So we have individual contributors and then we have the managers who are hopefully also leaders in some way, but then we also have the leaders who are not necessarily managing people. I would go as far and say in regards to also what Teresa said, the people that I'm looking for or the 10X engineers or the 10X product managers are actually not the individual contributors who are extremely talented but just people who are leaders who actually bring some of their knowledge to others, right? So like to empower them. Do you have any hot takes on this? I think this notion of leadership being tied to people management is, it's a tricky one because often the two are, they are sort of synonymous. If you're in a leadership role, you're also a people manager, but that's not necessarily the case in a cross-functional product team. In fact, some companies I see more and more, they distinguish, especially on the engineering side, they distinguish between like tech leads versus ma engineering managers who are more people man doing more people management roles as opposed to having expertise in their product and their customers, making sure the teams have enough context to make the choices. So mostly I will say when I'm working with product leaders, they are people managers. Like that's very rare that I see mainly at a very small company. Usually the product leader is leading at least a couple of product managers at their company. And every company defines the responsibilities of the product leadership role very differently, right? Sometimes it's product design. Sometimes it's product design engineer. Sometimes it's product design analytics. Sometimes it's just product. So like every company has different expectations of their product leader. But I do typically see the companies that have, that are more outcome oriented, that product leader is a member of the leadership team. They may not be a C-level member of their leadership team, but they are a recognized member of the executive team within their organization. So hmm. the one issue that I have with this is, is that I've been trying to enable dual career paths now, also like where I am right now, like at Jua. Mm -hmm. And the one, the, one of the weird things is happening when we talk about leadership meetings. You know, like people getting together, it's always like the C-suit, all the head offs and everything. And everybody just comes together and has a very nice chit chat. But one of my best leaders is actually my staff PM. Mm. 
he's not an executive, right? Mm-hmm. So like, then sometimes kind of like these communication waves, you know, like the kind of break apart. And this is where I just don't have an answer yet. I know I have conflicting views also from my guests in regards to, is this the right way or should it not be? But in the end, I don't know. I feel like if you manage people, it takes away attention from the customers. I do think so. I really do think so. That, so back to your point also, Teresa, I think in terms of autonomous or empowered, I feel like, yeah, in an ideal world, if you know everything about the customer, then you also don't need more, you don't need kind of play to play rank to say like, okay, this is how it is because I say so, right? I cannot remember that I had any other bigger disagreements also at the company where I worked at simply because we worked together as a team. And to me, that's really empowered. Like if you just, you, you have your garden and you can decide for yourself and this is what we're going to do. And uh, yeah, it was best professional years of my life, definitely. Yeah, I think, Leah, you're talking about something that I think is often overlooked, which is when the team, including the leader, is working from the same knowledge base. So decisions are being made based on what you're learning about from the customer and not my opinion versus your opinion. A lot of those disagreements go away, right? And this distinction of like, am I empowered? Am I autonomous? They don't really matter. We're just working together. I think where we get into trouble is where one or both parties, the leader and or the team, are not engaging with customers. They're not doing it together. They're not sharing that context. Then they're disagreeing on the path forward. And we see hierarchy come into play. Well, I'm the leader. I make the decision. Yeah. And I think, Leah, when you described earlier the challenge where you're, I don't know why, but it sounds like your leadership team wasn't relaying a real constraint and decision made by the board, then the te- you as a member of the team was operating with a blind spot and that for whatever reason that wasn't being addressed by your leadership team. You were just hearing no, or we won't, or we can't without the why behind it. I think like if you know, and it sounds like it was a resource allocation or an investment decision that the board, uh, unless they just thought it was the wrong strategic direction. But anyway, it seems like that's missing context. And that's where like, even if the team has deep understanding of their customers, their alternatives, they've explored the opportunity space well, if they're missing that context from their leadership about any real constraints on the business or strategic decisions that have been made, you know, across other functional leaders or at the board level, it's really difficult for the team to make good choices for their product investments. It definitely is. And I cannot talk now too openly because otherwise I'm getting an actual hot water here. (laughs) But let me just graciously just like pivot to another story that I actually had from Sunrise where, so Sunrise is a Swiss telecom provider in Switzerland and they have like, I don't know how many people, but like four or 5,000 people or something on payroll. And I remember distinctly that the CEO back in the days when I was there was having weekly calls with customers and support agents, the CEO, right? So like we're talking about like a really big company of multiple, multiple layers. So the question to you, Teresa, is how many interviews does a C-level have to do per week with the customers? Or do they have to at all? I think everybody in the organization should be talking to customers. I was a startup CEO. We did not have 4,000 employees, but I talked to a customer literally every single day. And that's a job where you have too many jobs. But it, that's not a habit I was going to let fall by the wayside. Because how do I know what my market needs if I'm not talking to customers? So, I mean, obviously I teach product teams how to do this, but I think everybody in the organization needs to be talking to customers all the time. Every day, one? Is that what it is? Well, I let us, this was during a time period where our entire market shifted during the 08 financial crisis because we were selling recruiting software. So... That's the worst industry to be in in a severe downturn, as I know Hope knows as well. And it was the way that I got us out of it, right? Is I had to find needs that were still prevalent when no companies were hiring. Would I have done that forever? I don't know. It wasn't that hard to do, to be honest. It was not that hard to do. I mean, it's just one meeting a day, right? When you're an executive, you're in meetings all day. Can you spend 10% of your time learning what your market needs? I think so. Okay. Have to say one thing here. 
it is not so easy for most companies to organize that many calls with people who actually also show up. I mean, you're a pro, right? <laughs> like I also did, like, I think I did the math. I think I did a thousand interviews now in my career. You probably did 10,000. Um, if you do one per day, I mean, then you oh my God. But like, it is really fascinating, right? Like you also need to have kind of probably an executive assistant at some point, right? That also organizes the interviews. Was it also for you really interesting that, I mean, you both manage people in your career, right? So you start somewhere, then you have this kind of dream of like, okay, now the career goes up, right? So you're doing a lot of interviews then you start to manage people, you do less interviews. And then you're like, hey, this people management thing is only partially fun. So now I'm going back to interviewing people again, just like in situations that you just described, right? The market is in complete turmoil. You're kind of going back to pre-product market fit, trying to figure out what is going on with anything, maybe also even existential angst. I don't know. But was this also the same for you? Or are you just like, you know what, like, let's go back to the roots because I kind of missed this because it definitely was the case for me as well. Like, I just love talking to customers in general especially if they're emotional about the stuff. <laughs> yeah, I can answer. I felt like when I was leading product teams and I, I led other functions as well, it actually, uh, my approach was enablement. Like I really wanted my teams to be the ones closest to the customers. Like I definitely would join and I would shadow, I would watch recordings, watch user testing interviews, anything. But I didn't want to end up with a different line of pursuit than they were. And so that's why I really focused on enablement of the teams. And if they were blocked and I would have them share out what they were learning, I would make that very transparent to the organization in multiple formats. But as a leader, I was the people management and enablement, as well as like understanding the business context and strengthening my relationship with other functional leaders and understanding what might be changing within their view of the business. So that's sort of how I split my time. I didn't have any sort of separate lines of inquiry that I was seeking customer, direct customer feedback from. I think this is also a, a maturity of the company and a phase of the company. So when I talked about interviewing customers every day as a CEO, we were a 12 person company. Hope had more than 12 people on our team. Right. So there's this, there's stages here, right? When you're a company in crisis and we basically went from having product market fit to gr and growing to suddenly overnight losing product market fit in two different products, literally overnight. Like we lost 60% of our revenue in 30 days. Like we were in crisis. I didn't have a whole bunch of product people to enable. <laughs> it was get out there and figure it out. Now, if I was in Hope's situation and I had 20 people on my team and I have 20 different teams, I'm of course not doing all the discovery for my teams. I want my teams doing the discovery. But I don't think it means as a leader, I can ignore what we're learning from the customer. And I know Hope wasn't ignoring what her teams are learning from the customer. In fact, in one of her roles, I was coaching some of her teams and Hope's was very hands-on with those teams. Right. So I think it's less about like who's conducting the interview, who's driving the line of inquiry. It's more about is everybody in the organization from very top all the way to very bottom aware of what we're learning and how we're learning from our customers and what those lines of inquiry are so that we're staying aligned as an organization. So when you said that this happened in like, what did you say, 30 days? Yeah. And how much top line did you lose? Was this cancellation after cancellation or just like, uh, like what, what happened there exactly? Yeah, we were a startup. We had two different products. One product we sold to uni universities to run their alumni communities. And another product was a recruiting product we sold to companies where they could recruit potential employees out of those communities. Well, in the fall of 08, a lot of our biggest customers were banks that were looking to recruit out of our um, university communities. Was it Lehman Brothers? When Lehman Brothers went out of business, we saw that our sales pipeline go to zero overnight, like literally zero overnight on the recruiting side. We were under contract with existing companies for about a year. But when those renewals came up, like I don't know if you were working during the 08 downturn or like what environment you were in at that time period. But like- I think I was at Microsoft. We saw companies- go from hiring a ton a year earlier in 07 to literally hiring nobody in 08. So as those renewals came up, 
they all did not renew. Like 100% of them did not renew. At the same time, our universities are dependent upon state and state budgets or endowments. The stock market cratered during that time period. So they saw their endowments shrink and state budgets were under pressure. And so our universities were also squeezed. And what we started doing was we started giving our university product away for free because they were our supply. And we had no demand on the recruiting side, but we knew if we lost our supply, it would never come back. So one side of our revenue, we basically had to give that product for free overnight. And then on the recruiting side, we had to get really creative with how do we keep these companies under contract, even though they're not hiring? And what can we offer them, even though they literally have zero job rents? And I know Hope was at Career Builder during this time period, so she probably can share what they were seeing. I know we were not the only ones in the recruiting industry that literally our revenue fell off a cliff. Yeah. And we, at that time, I just remember this, we had had a minorly diversified revenue streams and we were working with a lot of, I mean, in hindsight, I were a little bit regretful about it, but we did what we could, private education, online education providers. So like there's a nice sort of, you know, complement between the recruiting and the education sectors. And so when a lot of people are, losing their jobs, online education, and usually B2C spending goes up as opposed to, you know, B2B recruiting is less when people aren't hiring. So that's how we kind of weathered that storm. And we diversified the types of employers that we were working with from companies that were, you know, most affected by the downturn to like healthcare and others that were less affected by the financial downturn. The joy of scale, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? We yes. did not have. I, the we joy were in a different scale. position. We mm-hmm. were again a thirty-person company that dropped to a twelve-person company to survive the downturn, and I think we had like a million and a half in revenue. Versus Career Builder was what like eight hundred million in revenue, and yeah, God probably knows at that how many time. Employees. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so again, scale, right? It's where you are. It's the maturity of your company. We were not a very mature company. We were a recently product market sick growth startup that saw our business fall apart overnight. So this is quite fascinating because I just remember everything that happened back then. (laughs) Now I'm starting to connect the dots. So I was at Microsoft in a partner project that we were running with Ringier. Ringier is a very big publishing house. And what happened to us is, is that you all like... What this market crash did is it just slashed all the budgets that came in from online advertising, all of it, like 75%. I don't know whether it was overnight or whatever, but like, and I was much, much more junior, of course. But that's the one thing that I distinctly remember. And then we started to let go the journalists. Now, a publishing house letting go journalists, (laughs) that is like, I don't know, that's not good, right? Like that's your kind of product. And that was very, very scary. Interestingly, what happened in... Two, when was it? Was this two years ago? Like, when did we have the correction? Leah does not know. With the, like the most recent one where I lost like 70% of my stock portfolio in HubSpot. <laughs> Thank you, HubSpot. It started to feel a little bit the same because for us, it was not overnight, but it was over like one or two weeks. It just like, you know, like gradually a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And you were just like, should I sell? Should I sell? Should I sell? You know, like I just went down and down and down and down and down. Do you think, okay, mate, this is a very economic question, but like it kind of brought back the spirits from the past for me a little bit. And I feel like for a lot of people as well. And that's also maybe what ignited a little bit of the panic. And then recently, a couple of months ago, the entire SVB thing again, and you're just like, whoa, are we? Are we, are we going there? Because I don't want to go there anymore, right? Like, because tech is always getting the beating first. And then inside of tech, it's marketing. I don't know. Did you also feel that this is kind of the same again? Or like, did you panic a little bit? Because I did. I definitely did. I think for me, and I'll let Hope comment on this. We've talked about this a lot with each other because we do a lot of business together. This is not the first recession I've faced. And I think 08 was way worse. And I also lived through 01. I think if you're going to run a business or you're going to work in a role where you're responsible for a P&L, you have to have an understanding of broader economic cycles and you can't manage your product or your business for just the good times. You have to be prepared. And I think where the last couple months does not feel like 08 is the companies in tech that are doing layoffs are still profitable. And it to me, they didn't feel necessary. Did they overhire during COVID? Absolutely. That's what it was. Yeah. From a good business decision, course correct, sure. 
But did they lay off out of dire financial need? No. Whereas it's in opportunistic. 08, I think, I think, yeah, I think both in 01 and in 08, we saw tech companies in dire financial need where they had to let employees go or go out of business. And that's where we were. Like I became the VP of operations of this startup in October of 2008. We had six weeks of runway. If we didn't lay off most of our team, we were going out of business. Like there was no decision to be made. The decision was made for us. This time around, it did not feel that way. It felt like, yes, we're in a high inflation time period. Yes, interest rates are high. Yes, the world changed very quickly. But we also could have seen it coming, right? We saw supply chain issues. We saw tons of stimulus money flood into the market. Like it's not a surprise we're in an infl inflationary period. Like I think businesses could have planned for this better. And I think we're seeing a lot of copycats. It's politically safe to do layoffs and companies are taking advantage of that. Yes, I think that's exactly right. And I mean, we still have record low unemployment. I do. I think it's like a belt tightening because there was overspending, exactly as you said, overhiring, overspending. And, you know, people are being more prudent with their budgets. But I don't think this is something that will last for an extended period of time. Maybe I'm optimistic. But I also think that some of the things that that we focus on are good decision making habits <laughs> that yeah. are independent of the economic climate or your company's financial constraints. Every team, every leader deals with real constraints in their business all the time. Good times, bad times. There's always, everybody complains about not having enough resources in the best of times. So we yep. have to make good decisions because every decision we make has opportunity cost. And so it's really just, we continue to focus on those fundamentals. I think hope that last piece is so critical. Like one of the stories that I shared in my book it was a team that Hope coached using my curriculum, which was, is it Travagat? No, uh, it Tra was no, um, Sarah. Sira. So Sira focuses on travel when COVID hit and all travel ground to a halt. They literally were facing what I was talking about in 08, like their business dried up overnight. What did they do? They relied on the discovery habits. They didn't like panic. I mean, maybe they panicked a little bit internally because that's normal and human, but they still like, they fell back on what they were taught and what they knew and what they'd been practicing. They got out and they interviewed customers and they found opportunities that were relevant even when there was no business travel, which is what their primary market was. And I think that's the key is that like, yeah, we can panic and that's a normal human response, but what's going to get us out of it? And this is partly why I was saying like, as a CEO, I still interviewed customers every day because I knew that was the only thing that was going to get us out of it. It wasn't sitting in a boardroom with my directors, like panicking over the economy. I can't control the economy. I can go talk to my customers and learn about how I can continue to serve them today. Here's an interesting bit. So let me just make a circle back to what we said before about managers and leaders. So I read a really interesting article by um, Stuart Butterfield, Slack CEO, or like ex-Slack yep. CEO. And he's, he formulated it much better than what I, what, what I wrote about originally. And that was, for me, there's always like this 200K profit per employee. That's the magical line. As soon as you make three, 400,000, you're kind of being asked from the board that has FOMO, why are you not investing this money, Leah? Why are you so profitable, per employee? You're not investing enough from this money into your company. And that's kind of a problem. So if you're a product leader or manager or, I don't know, whatever, whatever your fancy title is, what are you doing if you can spend money? You start to hire people. And that is a fundamental problem because what we're doing essentially also in these companies, and that is my big issue, is we're starting to incentivize people still by status that if you manage more people, for some reason, you're more important. And how do I know this? Because every time we introduce each other, we just talk about our titles. We talk about how big the company was. Oh, yes, I was working in the toilet when Uber had its IPO. And therefore, like, I'm really successful, right? This is annoying me so much. And I had a fight with someone, obviously online, because why wouldn't you fight online with people that said that I'm totally unimportant because the company where I'm working at has 20 people. And <laughs> just like, hey, you know what? Okay, buddy, that's fine. But this is this. I think this is really the underlying problem in that we think that if you have budget, which is not yours, it's the company's, and I can prop up my own status, why don't I just hire more people? 
And I'm not 100% sure whether, whether I was always immune to this myself, but I think this is a part of the problem, right? Like we give too much status, we give too much still, like, I don't know, Leia managed 15 people. It's just that this is a problem if you Kingdom manage Kingdom building. People. You know, what's yeah. funny is I actually think you learn a lot more and have a much bigger job when you have fewer people and you're at a smaller company, right? Like it's, we get it almost exactly backwards. And I'm not trivializing like what it takes to grow into a big company and what it takes to keep a big company growing because obviously those are big jobs and big responsibility and there's a lot of revenue dollars tied to that. But if you're at a 20 person company, your job is very different and actually covers a lot more responsibility than if you're at a 10,000 person company, regardless of what your job is, <laughs> right? Right. The, you get more specialized, the larger the company, the more yeah. subdivided the roles for sure. Now, oh, the bigger the company, it. the more that's on the line, right? Like the more revenue on the line, the more your decisions are going to impact dollars and big dollars. So I don't think that one is necessarily better than the other. But I agree with you, Leah, that this like turf building, kingdom building, I think as Hope just said, yeah. is a big part of the problem. And I think it's why we saw a lot of overgrowth in tech and during COVID. Let me ask you both a question. So there is a specific limit that I have in a company. So like specific signals that start to appear when a company grows. So let's say, okay, let's say we're competent in what we do and we start to scale the companies that we're working in. Company grows, we're, we're hiring more people and product ops is getting on the scene. Because that's for me usually the side where I'm like, okay, I mean, yeah, okay, let's bring them in as much as we can. We have to and so forth. But now I'm slowly starting to get out. So for me, the ideal company size that I love working at is usually between 150, 200 people max. And then I start to look kind of like a little bit downwards again, you know, because I love scaling things after product market fit. Is there some kind of size or signal where you feel like, okay, now it's time to go? Like this is something that I do not enjoy. You personally, either one of you. For me, when I was a full-time employee, it was always at really small companies. I always, under 50 was my sweet spot. And that's because I am a zero to one product person. I want to figure out the new product. What's interesting is like, I listen to a ton of the like current podcasts on like product-led growth and scaling a company. And I find all of that fascinating. I have zero full-time experience in that realm. The largest company I worked at was 120 people when I left. And it felt way too big for me. Yeah, I have a feeling the answers to this question is going to be a direct reflection of your personal career experiences. Like I've worked yep. at some small companies, some large companies, startups, like I've not worked at every, but I worked at AOL Time Warner, like, and I worked at, you know, like a 50 person startup in Seattle. So I've seen the gamut. For me, the signal is like, I like to be able to know most people's names. Like when I was at Career Builder, like I, there were 3,000 people spread amongst different offices. Like I hated personally as a leader at that company, I hated the feeling of somebody knowing my name and I didn't know their name. Like I, I hate that feeling. And so I like, I want to know who to pick up the phone, who to talk to, you know, how things work. So to me, I don't have a magic number on it, but that's the feeling for me. I will share like, I hope you probably agree with, have seen this too. We've, as coaches, we've coached teams at all types of companies, like all types of companies, really large multinational companies, all different industries. And I will say like everybody we work with faces really unique challenges, like the size of the company, the industry that they're in, like there's always interesting product problems. And, every, and while they're unique, everybody thinks they're completely unique. And I think what we see is there's more commonality across teams, regardless of industry, regardless of company size, regardless of company culture. Like it turns out as product people, we share way more than I think we're unique. And I think that's important to recognize because I think we over-index on like, I need someone with B2B experience. Or I need someone with B2C experience. Or I need someone that's worked at a 100,000 person company. And I think really like what we need is people with a product mindset that like want to work on their product skills and they probably could drop into most of those environments. Oh my God, I have so much to say to this. First of <laughs> all, yes, if we go to conferences, I mean, definitely what happens to me is, is that everybody knows my name and I don't know theirs. The other problem is I cannot remember faces. <laughs> I'm really bad at this with names, but let's just put this to the side. So I 100% agree. I think we still over-index on domain experience because it's the one thing where we feel like we have kind of control over it. Turns out 
some of my worst hires that I did, and my fault, nobody else's fault, was people that were the perfect domain experience match. Perfect, perfect match. But culturally, you know, like I ignored a couple of red flags and so forth. And, you know, so I was wondering if you teach teams in such a diverse kind of set. So what I do is I do retainer consulting and I do retainer consulting mostly now for sales led companies who want to do something product led. And that's kind of like a fancy word for like how to do good product management if you've never done it, because sales led companies are usually very directive, you know, like product serves like a function as to when have we, when do we have the next feature to ship? It's never about unshipping anything and not about the customer. And I am very allergic to frameworks. So I think like not all the frameworks, of course, Teresa, yours is obviously an exception. But I feel like we have an over-reliance on this belief that if you just learn the correct framework or, I don't know, like RICE or whatever, or like here's how you organize your JIRA backlog or whatever, like this drives me absolutely mad. You know, like what tool should I use, Leah? And I said, I don't know. I really don't know. The main tools that I use in my day is Notion and Miro. That's it. That really is it. And this only because I cannot use a whiteboard anymore in this regard. And this is something where I feel like we seem to think or have been taught, I don't know, that frameworks kind of get us over our own imposter syndrome, right? I feel like learning how to do proper user interviews is a muscle that you have to train over and over and over and over again. And it does not, it's not so much about the frameworks, right? So like, this is a more like a dramatic statement from my side, but (laughs) I see you want to say something. Okay, so I think the core of this is thinking is hard. And rarely in business are we encouraged to take the time and to do the work to do real thinking. And so I think the reason why frameworks become a problem, including mine, is frameworks scaffold thinking. They don't replace thinking. But I can tell you, I hear from people every day asking me about why their opportunity solution tree doesn't work. And the first thing I ask them is, have you interviewed a customer? And they always say, no, they're just starting with what they know. They're not doing the work. They're not using the framework to scaffold their thinking. They're using the framework to replace their thinking. So I don't think frameworks are the problem. I think a really well thought out framework does a great job of scaffolding thinking. I think we're trying to use frameworks to replace our thinking And I think that's the problem. And I don't even think it's a problem at the individual level. I certainly see it at the individual level, but I think it's a business culture problem. We're trying to do too much. We're trying to move too fast and we're not preserving time to think. So it's kind of like a focus problem. Hope, I don't know. I think I felt like you wanted to say something about this. I do think it's moving too fast and wanting to get to that feeling of solving a problem quickly. I think every like a lot of people work in pro- want to solve problems. And so they think if I have a framework, I will get to a solution, a recommendation faster. But uh, to Teresa's point, like it's no substitute for like, do I really understand the problem? Is there just a problem or are there multiple problems? And how will I know if I've been successful? What is the goal? What's the measure of success? Like a lot of times, like the fundamentals haven't been exposed or clarified and no framework is going to fix that. Hmm. I've been thinking about this for a long time. So in a way, because this was kind of like the big shift for me when I was trying to get over my own imposter syndrome. So I had a horrible imposter syndrome. It's just, now it's just a bad imposter syndrome. It's not horrible anymore. So like we improved a little bit on that side. And I think a very interesting thing is, is that when I talk to younger people that, I don't know, for instance, they ask like, hey, so how did you grow your followers on LinkedIn this much? Or like, how did you do this? How did you do that? And, you know, aside from all that, like, yeah, you have to be consistent and you have to work hard and so forth. I really started to wonder that no matter how much I tell people how I do it exactly, you know, like on the tactical level with the frameworks, this is maybe also where my own failing came from. Most people didn't do put in the work. And it's not for a lack of trying or for a lack of wanting. I think it's because in some way we feel like if we just have the right tools, then we can be good enough to be recognized for what we do. And I feel like this is something that I didn't understand too much, that you need to almost be embarrassed with what you put out, right? But as long as you do it consistently, it's almost like with the frequency of customer interviews, Teresa, right? So like in a way that I have to talk to a customer once a week. Sorry, it's just once a week. But, and it doesn't matter which one it is. I just make it happen. And if it's Friday and I have not talked to anyone during this week, then I'm going to take someone from the street. And even if it's that, right? It needs to be uncomfortable. It needs to be 
without kind of compromise in this regard. And this is what I feel like has actually helped me get over my imposter syndrome. I'm just like, okay, no, I'm just going to do it. And then I feel embarrassed afterwards. And in regards to this product discovery, it feel, feels like, I don't know whether I ever was convinced that what I do is 100% certain, you know, like the evidence that you were talking about. But I have come to a conclusion that, you know what, I actually have a really good feel for this. I'm often wrong, still are, but 40% conviction is sometimes also good enough, you know, like just to see where something is also going. And this is kind of a balance. Okay, this was now a word salad, but like this is kind of like a balance that I was trying to figure out for myself because an imposter syndrome is always telling you, no, you're not sure enough. You're not sure enough. You're not sure enough. You're not getting out of this. Did you also kind of deal with this ever in your career? Like, could not imagine, right? Like, who has an imposter syndrome? But like, did you ever deal with this also earlier in your career? Or like, are you still dealing with it today? I'm sure I did. But I think I felt it for different, maybe different reasons. I think about when I was first on an executive team and I was the youngest person. I was the only woman who wasn't in HR. Like I, I had doubts, like, am I too young? Am I really qualified for this? But I also felt like it was amplified because many of the other leaders had such hubris <laughs> that I was like, how do you express yourself while having reasonable doubts with what you're saying, but not have that cause other people to have doubts in what you're saying? And so like it was, I found that a difficult thing to navigate. And I think that's why I'm so attracted to this more discovery centric ways of making decisions, because I want that confidence through evidence. And once I feel like, oh, no, there's a signal there, like, I have no problem being confident and being able to back it up and question others in their line of thinking so that I can understand if they have evidence that I'm not familiar with. And it just sort of unlocked for me a way of operating that felt authentic and reasonable. You know, imposter syndrome is interesting to me. So Leah, you started with like this, people reaching out about how did you build your audience on LinkedIn and a lot of people weren't willing to do the work. I think there's a few things going on here. Like, I think when you're earlier, early in your career, if like if you're a, a reasonably ambitious and capable person, there's like this striving that like you want to be ahead of where you are. You're striving for that next promotion. You're striving for attention. I went through this. Like, I remember in the early 2000s, there was this online publication, Boxes and Arrows. It was started by Christina Woodkey, and it was a design journal. And I submitted so many articles and got rejected time after time after time. And like, I kind of laugh now, like if I could go back in time and tell like my 20 something self, like, just be patient, it's going to be fine. Like plenty of people are going to pay attention to your work and like you will develop expertise. And I think it's easy to forget when you're six years into your career. Yes, you have experience. You still don't know that much. Like there's still a lot to learn. So like maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome is good, right? A lot of the people that people see visibly that have huge followings, like they're 20 years in. And so I think there's a little bit of this like trusting, they're 20 plus years in. Some of, you know, like I think there's a little bit of trusting that like if you're ambitious, if you're eager, if you're focused on learning, if you're focused on improving, like there's time. There's time to get there. There's time for that. So I think there's one, that's one piece, especially like on the thought leadership, growing the audience size side. I think on the like in your job part of it, like what Hope just said really resonates with me. I became a startup CEO at 32. Six months before that, or a year before that, I was on the executive team as the head of product. I was the only woman on the team. I had a fellow executive that literally turned his back to me every time I spoke because he didn't think I should be in the meeting. That was probably the first time I was exposed to like sexism in the hiring process and in the promotion process. Sure, I had a lot of imposter syndrome. And look, I spent my adult life in the San Francisco Bay Area where I saw peers become multimillionaires at age 25. And at age 32, I was the startup of a, I was the CEO of a struggling startup that was on the verge of going out of business you can bet I had imposter syndrome. Why wasn't I good enough to turn this company around? Okay, I don't think there was a single human on earth that was good enough to turn that company around. We got decimated by one of the most extreme financial events in our lifetimes. I can see that now. I could not see that then. It destroyed me. 
And I remember that I had a moment that really turned things around for me. I walked into a board meeting and it was really clear. Nobody on my board knew what we should do. And one, our chairman at the time was this like Silicon Valley luminary that everybody respected. We had a VC partner on the board. We had a CEO of another huge company that had just gone public on the board. We had an executive that had been at Monster, one of our biggest players in our space, who had no idea what we should do. And I remember looking around that room going, oh, we really are in a situation where humans don't know what to do. Great. I'm the CEO. I'm going to decide. And it was really empowering to recognize that like we don't know what to do in most of these situations. There's a lot of uncertainty. There is not a right answer, right? And I think a lot of imposter syndrome is we're learning to recognize it's not about having the right answer. It's about how do we create space for good thinking, to get feedback, to have feedback loops, to iterate, and to learn. Um, and I think so much of business culture presents it as you're supposed to have the right answer. So, of course, we have imposter syndrome. Do you want to say something to this, Hope? Because I have a lot to say. I, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I see it when I'm teaching classes, too. Like, there's this constant, am I doing this right? Is this right? Like, as though there's one right it's so ingrained in our ways of thinking that like, even when I say, I'm not trying to trick you, there's not like one hidden answer that I'm hoping you come up with. Like, (laughs) it just depends on what assumptions you make and what, you know, what you expose and, you know, your ability to make decisions as a team. And that is very uncomfortable. People are uncomfortable with uncertainty in an environment that rewards confidence and conviction and a false belief that there is one right answer. Yeah. Okay. Let's go with uh, Leo's psychology minutes just for a second. So I think for me, the thing was about three years ago, I was absolutely horrible to deal with because I could not accept that some people would not accept me. Right. So like also what you described, Teresa, of like someone not talking to you like this, I could not sleep at night. Like I just could not. And A very pivotal moment for me was that when my CPO actually made me cry in the first meeting that I had. So, you know, like I was dressing up all my achievements, everything that I did and so forth. And he just like, "Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm." he kind of recognized it. And in the second call, he opened the call with, Leah, everything you did and you showed me so far is total garbage. I think you're wasting your talents. I think you can do so much more than this. He made me cry. I went into immediate defense mode, of course, right? I'm just like, oh my God, why is this person that I respect so deeply? Because he is incredibly smart, right? Like, why is this person saying this about me? But he did not budge. And I actually needed this. I really needed this because it came from a, from a place of love from him. You know, like this was as radical candor as it could have been because he was exactly right. That was exactly what it is. I always was held back by not understanding specific things. You know, like I never went into financial understanding of companies because I always hid behind the kind of the excuse of, oh, I'm dyslexic, right? I cannot understand financial constructs that well as other people and so forth. But that was never the point. You can always get more context about something else on the outside, good enough to make a decision, but you don't have to be the CFO at the same time. And this really resonated with me, Teresa, when you also, I I think the way that you kind of said it is that sometimes you have only 30% of the context to make a decision, but then it's important that we all walk into the same direction. And you have to live with that in most of the cases you will be wrong, but that's fine. It's okay because you will 100% be wrong if you're not walking into the same direction. And I think that's what it was for me. So like this kind of growth mindset where I was just like, okay, just because he says my work is shit does not mean that he thinks I am bad. And that was incredibly difficult for me. Incredibly difficult. Yeah, that's what it was for my therapy side. <laughs> what I think is pretty crazy about business is that like, at least especially here in the US, but I have a feeling this is worldwide. We go to school for 18 years of our lives and we are taught to find the right answer right? We're rewarded for finding the one right answer. And then we come into business and a lot of that culture persists irrationally, right? Like there isn't a right answer and there are going to be like business is so much more about people skills and collaboration and playing the game and understanding the game, right? Like your comment about like shying away from financials. You can't really understand the game if you don't understand the financials. And I was the same way. I'll tell you, when I became the VP of operations of that startup 
I did not know the difference between bookings and billings and recognized revenue and unearned revenue. I didn't know any of that. I literally went to our CFO and was like, okay, teach me like I'm five years old because I've never been exposed to any of this. But you know what? I'm really glad I learned it because one, I have my own business now and it's been incredibly helpful. But two, I don't think you can build good products without a really rich understanding of your P&L and understanding the impact on revenue. And we teach, like Hope teaches a class called Defining Outcomes for Product Talk. And we start at the very beginning and we explain the purpose of your business, like the way your leaders are looking at it is looking at how profit is generated. And I can't tell you how many product people push back against that. It makes them really uncomfortable that the purpose of a business is to grow profit. But here's the reality. If you're a for-profit company, that is the purpose of your company. Now, they get bothered by this, and we get the Peter Drucker quote all the time, which is the purpose of a business is to serve a customer, and that profit is a side side effect of that. That is true. Your purpose of your business should be to serve your customer, but the way that we measure that is with profit. And if you're uncomfortable with the fact that the way that we measure that is with profit, you're going to have a really hard time building successful products. And I think this is that other context. Like as product people, we have to do the work to understand the whole business context. Otherwise, we're not doing our jobs. Yeah, it is very common when I'm teaching teams, even within an organization, and often we'll teach the masterclass using the team's actual outcomes. But I start, like, even if they show up to class with, we've got an outcome that we're working towards as a team, I ask them to deconstruct their company's revenue formula and... Nine times out of 10, the teams don't have a good handle on that. And I talk about this when we're teaching the class. I want both leaders and teams to be there because it's not a team failing. It is a leadership lack of communication, lack of transparency, lack of even recognizing that their teams don't understand the fundamentals of how their company makes money. And so I want to expose, if it doesn't exist, great, hooray, great. We can move on to seeing how the teams can influence driving revenue or cost savings or avoidance for their companies. But without exposing that, we can't correct for it as teams or leaders. And so it's a powerful and uncomfortable moment, but we can work with it. We can get better. No. Yeah. Maybe this is a great segue now into the last question that I have for you both, because we're unfortunately nearing the end. I could go on for another three hours before I'm completely melting in the current sun. I think I would love to hear what you both are kind of betting on in terms of trends that are coming up, because one of these, just what you just said is right now very much on top of my mind as well. And I feel like it goes further than just like understanding business financials. I feel like product people need to learn much more about sales. I think product people need to learn much more about marketing. Marketing needs to learn how to finally do product. And marketing also needs to learn how to do sales properly. I think we're going to move so much closer because of AI just like really automating away the garbage of our jobs so we can actually do our jobs, right? And But you cannot do discovery in a vacuum. You cannot sell in a vacuum without the product and you cannot advertise in a vacuum without the product. And I feel like this is definitely a trend that I'm betting on. So what I'm trying to say is, is that I feel like product sales management in some way or form will start to come up where product has to kind of establish sales pipelines much, much closer with sales. And they're not like living their secluded life on the revenue mountain there anymore. Are there any trends that you both are kind of betting on, maybe in this regard or maybe something else? Like, is there something that you feel like the industry is moving towards to in the next five to 10 years that is definitely happening aside from AI? <laughs> I think the next five to 10 years is going to look a lot like the last five to 10 years. I know that's a really boring answer, but in 2016, I gave a talk where I talked about, I think I introduced the opportunity solution tree and I talked about how, here's how the different methods we currently have fit in. And I said, five years from now, the methods might look different, but the structure is going to stay the same. And so five years later, starting in 2021, people started asking me how, how have the methods changed? And they haven't at all, right? They haven't changed at all, not even a single bit. And I think like the uncomfortable truth is that change and evolution happens on a really glacial pace. So I have a feeling I'm going to spend the entire rest of my life trying to teach teams how to interview week over week and how to run assumption tests week over week. And while that sounds a little bit depressing, I don't find it depressing because I think every single team that adopts it has a huge impact on their customer base 
on their company, on their employees' experience. And if it takes the rest of my life to get even another 5% of teams to do it, to me, it's worth it. So I don't, I really genuinely don't think a lot is going to change. I think we could talk 30 years from now and we're going to talk about the exact same things. I mean, I, I agree with that. I think some of it goes back to what we were just talking about. Like maybe it will take a generation, but there's still this ingrained education system that teaches for one right answer and encourages that confidence with having an impo- a point of view and leaders are elevated for making more right decisions than wrong decisions. So their ability to have a growth mindset, it, it's like uh, unlikely to occur. So I feel like until there is a generation of people moving into the product space that is more comfortable with there's not one right answer, there's what do we solve together as a team, right? Like I even see it in my own kids, right? Like they're the schools, at least that my kids go to, encourage much more team collaboration as opposed to stack ranking students in a class in terms of their ability to get the right answer. So I think it will take, maybe not quite a generation, but I feel like it's going to take some time to have the cross-functional collaboration outcome ways of, you know, measuring success to become the norm in companies. So I think we've, we're here to support that change and it'll take some time. We can look backwards, right? Michael Porter started writing about changes in strategy in the sixties and now, okay, so that's 60 years ago. Plenty of companies are trying to compete still on Taylorism efficiency, right? right? And I would argue even Porter's starting to become outdated, but we aren't adopting Porter yet. So, and same with Drucker, like there's tons of great stuff from Drucker that most companies aren't putting into practice. I Change is hard. Humans are messy. We get attached to what we've always done. I don't know. I We're going to make little incremental progress, but I think little incremental progress has huge impact. Yeah, I think so too. And it's always going back to first principles, right? In order to create a good product, you need to talk to the customers. And until that changes, I think you're going to be making good money, Teresa. So I'm very <laughs> happy for you. <laughs> and you too, obviously, I hope. <laughs> Okay, how can people get in contact with you both other than the LinkedIn profiles that I will definitely share in the show notes? Is there something that you would like to say otherwise? Like, is there any link, something that people should visit? I blog at producttalk.org. We also have a variety of online courses to help people build skill in the discovery habits at learn.producttalk.org. And you can find me on LinkedIn or go to fearless-product.com and schedule some time with me. I always like to do an initial coaching call about a topic that you're struggling with to see if it's a fit. And so that helps me sort of keep a pulse on what product leaders are challenged by these days. And more often than not, it's it's something that I have a reasonably informed point of view on. Yeah. And for what it's worth, if you want to have some social proof, Leah also recommends Hope because we already talked before. So I know a little <laughs> bit how you work. So yeah, there's that. Thank you so much for both of you to join me today. Thanks for including It was us. a very short hour. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Product Tea with Leah. If you don't have enough yet, you can subscribe to my podcast right now at Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can head to my website, leahtharin.com, which is L-E-A-H-T-H-A-R-I-N.com, where you can find much more of my material or just want to work with me. 